This is Harry Gallagher of Raytown, Missouri. A few months ago, he was working as a claim representative for an insurance company. Now, Gallagher is on active duty with the 303rd Troop Carrier Squadron. His job? Loadmaster on a C-124 Globemaster. This is Tom Iredale of San Diego, California. Five days a week, he's a deputy district attorney. Weekends, Iredale is a captain in the Air Force Reserve's 96th 22nd Recovery Squadron. His mission? Recover combat aircraft in case of nuclear war. The United States Air Force Reserve brings you Special Report, the story of the Air Force Reserve in action today, in readiness for tomorrow. Your narrator, Raymond Burr. As the Cold War crisis deepened during the summer and early fall of 1961, America looked to her air power. Decisions were made to strengthen our defenses and our ability to deal with limited or all-out war. In this emergency, the Air Force Reserve once again is playing a crucial role. What that role is and how it affects our security is the subject of this progress report. Belton is a small Missouri farm community typical of many in America's Midwest. Its 5,000 inhabitants take everything in stride, including the weather, which they say is unusual this winter of 62. Belton is also the home of Richard Gabauer Air Force Base. Last October, 1,200 officers and airmen of the 442nd Air Force Reserve Troop Carrier Wing arrived here on active duty. The story of the 442nd and its tactical squadrons, the 303rd, 304th, and 305th, is typical of all seven troop carrier units we called last fall. Today, Gallagher and his fellow airmen and officers of the 303rd are flying troops and equipment in C-124 Globemasters as part of the Air Force Tactical Air Command wherever in the free world they're needed. Each mission begins with a briefing session, attended by the whole crew. The C-124 Globemaster is flown by a crew of six to nine men, depending on the scope of the mission. This trip, it's the minimum of six. The aircraft commander, Major Val Jean Matthews, is briefing his crew. Matthews, a farmer in civilian life, has flown 325 combat hours. Matthews' co-pilot is Captain Clay Davis, They've flown together for three years. Davis was an oil company advertising manager. Lieutenant Frank Crawford is the navigator. Frank was a production engineer. Panel engineer Carl Chop is an accomplished aircraft engine mechanic. Engineer Pershing Lucas is a veteran of over 20 years service from World War II to the Cold War of the 60s. And the sixth man is Harry Gallagher, loadmaster. The Globemaster is one of the biggest long-distance haulers in the Air Force. It can carry 200 parachute infantrymen with full equipment. But this mission is somewhat different. Leaving Richard's Gabauer, the Globemaster's only cargo is its trained crew. Their orders are to fly to a plant site, pick up vital defense equipment, and deliver it to the Air Force Missile Test Center in Florida. This crew has flown many hours together as a service and since their call up to prepare for missions such as this. Now training pays off. Practice must prove itself in action. Through the long hours of flight, Sergeant Chop keeps vigil at the complex control panel. The conditions under which this mission is flown are far different from the conditions that earned the 442nd six battle streamers and a distinguished unit citation in Europe in 1944. From Rome to Normandy, 108 sorties in foul weather, unarmed, dodging ground fire. is secured, the flight crew take off for debriefing. Getting the cargo safely aboard the C-124 and tied down is Roadmaster Gallagher's headache. It could mean that somewhere one missile, one vital link in our aerospace defense is temporarily disabled due to a malfunction of ground support equipment.
Big as they are, the precious crates fit into the belly of the C-124 with room to spare. takeoff, and the crew is extra alert in the air. Somewhere in Florida, a missile crew is counting on the arrival of this electronic equipment. The men flying the C-124s have been called from home and career to active Air Force service. They might well wish that the next mission would end with home to bed and Monday morning back to the old job. But they will do what has to be done. They've done it before. The story of the 303rd and the other reserve troop carrier squadrons now on active duty is only part of this special report on the Air Force Reserve. CONAC, the Continental Air Command, largest in the Air Force, supervises all Air Force Reserve training. It has 1,900 units, more than 700 aircraft, and a manpower inventory of over half a million. Its commander is Lieutenant General Gordon A. Blake. General Blake. What are some of the other forms of reserve activity? First of all, I'd like to emphasize that the reserve is in full partnership with the regular Air Force all the way. This partnership takes many forms. In addition to the C-124 squadrons on active duty today, other reserve troop carrier units maintain and fly C-119 boxcars and C-123 providers. These units train on weekends and on two-week active duty tours, or wherever and whenever the Air Force needs them. They participate in joint exercises with airborne units of the Army. They fly mercy missions in local emergencies. They haul vital equipment to military installations all over the country. A variety of skilled communications, medical, and other support units are also part of today's Air Force Reserve. So too are the air rescue units, some of which were called to active duty last October. And that brings us to the newest mission for the Air Force Reserve, Aircraft recovery. General Blake, let's take a closer look at a recovery squadron. A squadron getting ready for a day we all hope will never come. Bruce Iredale of San Diego, California, Deputy District Attorney and Air Force Reservist, has not been called to active duty. Or you might say, he's on active duty all the time. Iredale belongs to the 96 22nd Recovery Squadron. His outfit is duplicated 200 times throughout the United States. If nuclear war comes, we have to assume that many or most regular Air Force bases will be damaged by the initial attack. Our strategic and tactical aircraft will already be in the air, delivering the first counter blow. That's where Air Force Reserve Recovery Squadrons come in. They will man the widely dispersed landing strips and supply the know-how to recover combat aircraft whose home bases are damaged. Iredale and thousands like him are the recoverers, specialists in many skills. They work in offices, in factories, and on farms across the country. Their dispersal is the nation's strength. And the premise is, this might be the real thing. Attorney Iredale into Captain Iredale, weather officer. This is a training exercise. The premise, nuclear attack on the United States. Dozens of Air Force bases have been damaged, including nearby March Air Force Base. Most of their SAC bombers were already airborne. When these homeless birds come back, the 96 22nd Recovery Squadron can handle them. At the airstrip, the squadron has plenty of civilian support, units of the local fire department, Ambulances from nearby hospitals with doctors, nurses, and medical supplies. Tractors, bulldozers, and other heavy equipment from local contractors. Policemen and sheriff's officers. The Civil Air Patrol. All on standby. The 
This is home for the homeless bird. An airstrip that's still intact because of its location and relative unimportance as a target. Survey meters show radioactivity. The first step is decontamination. signal, the B-52 is clear. The aircraft commander reports on the condition of his plane and crew. Repairs begin at once. The entire crew gets a medical check with special attention to radiation exposure. The pilot reports and receives his orders. After a weather briefing, he may fly to another base or launch on a strike mission. You can expect icing at about that height. The refueling crew go to work, covered by the volunteer firemen. In less than two hours, the B-52 has been recovered and made ready to strike the enemy again. Glad to see help. Real great. Next time, anytime. What you have just seen were the highlights of an Air Force Reserve recovery exercise. A grim reminder of the responsibilities we share in order to prevail against nuclear aggression. That completes our special report on the Air Force Reserve today. We await to a new crisis each dawn in the Cold War. Our national strength depends on our ability to pitch in with whatever resources we have. Air Force Reservists on active duty know this. They're ready and serving today. Those who remain at home are sacrificing less, but they share the same responsibility toward the readiness that will mean our survival tomorrow.